So say that you're a sociologist out somewhere in the field doing an interview and you start to realize the person you're talking to, uh, this guy, he's not telling you the truth. In fact, he might even be lying. What do you do? This is a very basic, a fundamental problem with qualitative social science that every field researcher will at some point have to face. The people that we interview, live with, and study sometimes don't tell us the truth, or at least give us biased and self-motivated accounts of their beliefs and actions. Now, the methods of anthropology and qualitative sociology rely on observation and good faith conversations with informants. So what happens when our informants give us incomplete or inaccurate information? Are our results equally inaccurate? Is anthropology doomed? Uh, well, if it is, it's not because of that. One of the first things we learn is the importance of triangulating data. When you're talking with someone about what they think about uh, an event, like a public ritual, for example, if we want to understand that ritual in a larger context, we'll pose similar questions to other people in order to understand the ritual more holistically from multiple different perspectives. When we do that, we're interested in how the different accounts converge and complement one another to form a cohesive cultural narrative but also the ways in which those accounts diverge, providing conflicting or even contradictory interpretations. And in this episode of Off the Shelf, I want to talk about that divergence, why it's not actually a problem for a lot of qualitative social science, and some of the ways that you can creatively incorporate biased and conflicting interviews into your research. And to do that, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite films of all time, Akira Kurosawa's 1950 masterpiece, Rashomon. Rashomon is set in 8th century Japan and takes place at the ruins of the Rashomon Gate, the great gate of the imperial city of Kyoto. The film opens in the driving rain, and we meet three characters who are sheltering from the storm. A woodcutter, a Buddhist monk, and a commoner. And to pass the time, the woodcutter and monk begin to tell the commoner about a strange criminal trial that took place a few days earlier, and the basic details of the crime are pretty simple. A samurai and his wife were traveling through the forest, they encountered a bandit named Tajumaru, played by Toshira Mufune in one of his weirdest roles ever, who captured the samurai, attacked and sexually assaulted the woman, and stole the samurai's sword. And at some point in all of this, the samurai was killed, and the criminal trial is devoted to discovering the killer's identity and motivations. What disturbs the woodcutter and monk, though, aren't the details of the crime, the murder and sexual assault, but instead the testimonies that they hear from everyone involved, from the bandit, from the woman, and from the dead samurai himself, whose spirit is channeled by a Shinto medium. And each of these three gives a radically different account of the same basic events, so much so that each character claims that they and they alone committed the murder, or in the ghost samurai's case, you know, committed suicide. And as we watch all of this through a series of equally plausible flashbacks, the question is put to the audience, which one of these characters actually killed the samurai, and why? Now I am leaving out a fourth account, the personal testimony of the woodcutter. It later turns out that he was an eyewitness to the whole crime, and towards the end of the film, he tells the monk and commoner what he saw, but his account is so different from the first three, and it turns out might be motivated by concealing a crime of his own, that were left in the same position as before. Even in light of eyewitness testimony, we have four equally plausible contradictory narratives and too little evidence to favor one over the others, and that's where the film leaves the audience. There's no resolution, no dramatic denouement where the villain shouts, you can't handle the truth, and puts the pieces together for the audience. At the end of the film, we're left just as clueless as the commoner, who complains that the more he hears about the crime, the harder it becomes to understand what actually happened. Film historians Blair Davis and Jeff Burnham note that on a first viewing of Rashomon, audiences tend to begin the film by accepting the first account of the murder that they hear. They take the testimony of the bandit at face value, but then as the film goes on, the audience takes an active role in drawing their own conclusions. They tend to reject each of the four narratives and create a fifth subjective and non-diegetic narrative, a kind of headcanon that solves the mystery to their own satisfaction. 
In short, in light of the conflicting narratives and the lack of satisfactory resolution, audiences are compelled to either consider the philosophical ramifications of the lack of resolution, of never knowing the truth, or they feel compelled to mediate the varying accounts into their own fifth, ostensibly truer version of events. And in many academic fields, including film criticism, anthropology, and sociology, we call the coexistence of multiple contradictory point-of-view testimonies the Rashomon effect. And in social science research, the Rashomon effect can influence scientific observers in the same way as it influences the film's audience. In similar situations, we can sometimes feel compelled to uncover or even create the truth by interpreting and combining multiple contradictory narratives. And the thing is, in qualitative research, the Rashomon effect is a trap. In fact, it's an epistemological trap that's very easy to fall into, particularly for novice researchers. When you're new to qualitative research, the Rashomon effect is a tangible thing. In fieldwork, you will hear contradictory narratives. Sometimes informants lie, they omit information, or they give biased and conflicting accounts of their actions and beliefs. And when that happens, researchers sometimes feel compelled to figure out the truth with a capital T, to gauge which informants are being truthful, and then reject the accounts that they think are untruthful or were given in bad faith. And from a positivist perspective, that makes a lot of sense. In fact, as a quantitative method, it's called data cleansing, the process of detecting and removing inaccurate or corrupt data from your records to present an objectively more accurate representation of whatever it is that you're studying, which is great as a form of quantitative analysis. But qualitative methods in anthropology and sociology, things like ethnography, for example, evolved to see the world in a completely different way from their quantitative counterparts. And this is why the Rashomon effect is an epistemological problem, a problem that relates to studying the limits of human knowledge. This is a huge simplification, but where natural science and quantitative sociology are interested in measurable and empirically verifiable facts. The sun is a star, for example, or X number of people live in the United States. By contrast, qualitative approaches are much more interested in subjectivity, not in what we know to be true exactly, but in understanding our relationship to the cultural, economic, and ideological systems in which knowledge and belief are themselves produced. Circling back to Rashomon and the Rashomon effect, we can now begin to confront the epistemological problems posed by the film from a qualitative research perspective. And with that lens, as strange as it may seem, solving the mystery of the samurai's murder and uncovering which characters are lying or intentionally distorting events is a second-order problem at best. It certainly wouldn't hurt to know, of course, but a good qualitative researcher wouldn't approach the criminal trial or the film's character interactions with the goal of uncovering an objective truth. To paraphrase Fisher and Monahan, rather than invalidating or cautiously tolerating data derived from stage performances or unreliable narratives, qualitative researchers embrace that kind of data, not as a representation of any singular truth necessarily, but as a rich symbolic text that lends itself to multiple interpretations and gives us critical insight into the cultures that we study. So rather than focusing on which narrative most closely resembles the truth or on how we could adapt the conflicting narratives to tell our own truth, a qualitative researcher would ideally respond to the Rashomon effect by using the absence of verifiable facts and the multiplicity of conflicting narratives to deepen their understanding of the cultural context in which the crime was committed. If we were interested in studying gender, for example, we might ask how sexual violence is framed and perceived differently by each character in relation to the legal framework of the trial. And we would then use the conflicting accounts to help us understand different perceptions of gender and sexual assault in the film's story world. We might interview the characters and their close acquaintances to learn more about their understanding of consent and gender roles, or conduct ethnographic research to deepen our own understanding of gender and sexuality in the cultures and subcultures in question. That would be a gender-oriented reading of the crime, but we could just as easily shift our research to focus on social stratification and class, or the mediating role of social constructs like shame and honor in each narrative and their relationship to the ideological and social systems in which the characters live. Different qualitative methods have different approaches, but in a very general sense, our ultimate goal would be to gain an emic or insider's understanding of the events, allowing us to trace out 
each character's potential motivations and place their testimonies in a more holistic social and cultural context. So where quantitative approaches would provide us with factual data, X number of people were killed this year outside of the Rashomon Gate, a qualitative approach to the film's events would put those stats in a meaningful cultural context, helping us demonstrate the complexity of intersocial interaction and radical human subjectivity. Now, I don't want to suggest that all bad faith interaction provides usable data. It doesn't. And the only way to really gauge where the line between rich cultural text and unusable data is, is for researchers to get out into the field themselves and learn to weigh the relative merits of different testimonies in relation to their research topic and methods. Also, none of this should suggest that qualitative social science is uninterested in empirical research or objectively verifiable facts. We are. I mean, I certainly am. But an understanding of that information tends to form our edict, or outsider's scientific perspective of the events and topics that we study. And unless we're doing applied research, we put on a very different hat when we do qualitative fieldwork. So if you're interested in anthropology and sociology, always consider what the best methods would be for your particular research situation. And if you're doing qualitative field work, don't forget your hat. And as always, never stop learning. It's become customary to thank my Patreon supporters, and I'm going to keep it up. The fact that some of you are willing to support me in making this body of work means the world to me. And if you out there, yes, you would also like to say that you're a patron of independent social scientific education and critical pedagogy, hop on over to our Patreon page and give us a look. Mm -hmm.